How do I use Le Chatelier's principle to determine the effect of changing one of the factors that affect the equilibrium? Well, thank you very much. Let's just quickly repeat that question for our viewers at home. He asked us, how do I use Le Chatelier's principle to determine the effect of changing one of the factors that will affect the equilibrium? Okay, now we're going to need to obviously take a look at the chemical equilibrium. Now, please don't confuse this section with last week's rate of reaction. These things have got nothing to do with each other. They do not have things in common. Okay, so let's just first quickly take a look at the three factors in this case that will affect the chemical equilibrium. The first one that we'll be getting taking a look at is the concentration secondly we'll be taking a look at pressure and lastly we'll be taking a look at temperature now usually when we talk about concentration it refers back to our liquids and when we talk about pressure it refers back to our gases so let's first start off by taking a look at Le Chatelier's principle and see what it actually means now this Le Chatelier's principle you're going to need to know off by heart so please make sure that you go and study it it states that when a system in equilibrium is subjected to a change the system would like to repair the equilibrium by opposing the change so what it basically means is if you do something to it, it would like to do the opposite so that it can go back the way that it was before you made any changes to it. Now, we are talking here about a chemical equilibrium. Now, you might ask yourself, what is a chemical equilibrium? That is when we're going to have the rate of the forward reaction being equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Now, let me just quickly explain that further by taking a look at a type of reaction. So, if we're going to be having our reactants forming products, notice though that we're going to be ending up reactants forming products and at the same time products breaking up forming reactants again. So when we talk about a chemical equilibrium, then it means the time it takes for this reactant to break up and form products must be equal to the time it will take for a product to break up and form reactants. So that means as one particle breaks up to form a product simultaneously, a product particle will again break up to form a reactant. So that's when we're going to be having a chemical equilibrium condition. Okay, now let's first start off by taking a look at our concentration, which is one of the factors that will affect the chemical equilibrium. Now it says that the system would oppose an increase or decrease in concentration by favoring the side that will oppose the change. Now your system, which is basically a reaction, can only do one of two things to change this. It can either favor the forward reaction, that means we go from reactants to products, or it can favor the reverse reaction, which means it's going to go from products back to reactants. So let's first take a look at an example to see maybe you understand this a bit better now. So I'm going to be having a reaction that's going to be a co cobalt chloride, which is a bluish color, together with water, and it will form on the other side two products, which will end up being a pink color. Now, if I'm going to add in more water into the system, now this is something that we do externally. So the system, which is then my reaction, would like to oppose that. So he would like to do the opposite. So if we've increased the water, the system would like to go and decrease the water. Now, you can only try to decrease it by either favoring the forward or the reverse reaction. The only difference here that we will see, though, is if it favors the forward reaction, we will take away some of the reacting particles and we'll form more products. If we favor the reverse reaction, then we take away some of the products and we'll form more reactants. So because we want to end up decreasing it, or rather the system wants to decrease it, it will favor the forward reaction so that it will take away some of these reactants and form more products. And if the forward reaction is favored and we form more products, we'll notice that our solution will end up turning pink. So they can typically end up giving you a reaction like this with different colors. And then they would like to know what color is the solution going to turn. Now let's take a look if we do the opposite. So instead of us increasing the water, we are now going to decrease the water. Remember that the system would like to do the opposite. That means it would like to increase the water and it will do so by then favoring the reverse reaction because we will be breaking down products to form more reactants and that means we're going to end up forming for us then a blue solution. Okay, so this is what a typical type of concentration changes is all about. It's just about either favoring the forward or the reverse to either increase or decrease the concentration depending on what you've done with it. 
Now let's go over to our pressure. And as we said, pressure only applies for gases. Now it says that if I'm going to have an increase in pressure, it will favor the side with less gas molecules. And in order for you to be able to determine which side is less gas particles, please go and count the number of gas particles. Now let's take a look at a reaction to explain this. We're going to be having here the harbor process, which is our nitrogen and hydrogen gas that will form ammonia. Now first off, when we need to go and count the number of gas particles in my reactant site, we're literally going to count the number of moles in the front. So this is actually one. That means we're going to have one nitrogen molecule and we're going to be having three of my hydrogen molecules. So in total, I end up with four of my gas particles in the first block. If I take a look here at my products, which is the ammonia, we notice there's a two in the front. That means we're going to be having two of my ammonia particles. Now, if we take a look here at the first block, we're going to have four particles. That means if I've got four particles, the chances of them colliding with each other and the side of the container is very good because there's so many of them. And whenever they collide with each other and the side of the container, they exert pressure. That means we will have an increase in pressure if I have more particles in that same volume. But if I take a look at my product side, remember that there was only two particles over there. That means they will actually collide with each other less and therefore we will have a lower pressure being exerted if there's less particles. So as we said, if I have more particles, then it means that we're going to be having more collisions. Therefore, there will be an increase in the pressure. And on the other hand, if I have less gas particles, it means less collisions and thus it ends up being a decrease in pressure. Now let's go and take a look at an example on this and see if we are able to answer it. So they're asking us over here, the pressure of the following reaction has been decreased. Which side of the reaction would be favored? Now notice though that we actually ended up decreasing the pressure. So that means the system would like to do the opposite, which means it would actually like to increase the pressure. Now it can only increase the pressure by either favoring the forward or the reverse reaction. But if it wants a higher pressure, it needs to favor the side with more gas particles involved. So if we quickly go and count again, we notice that on our reactant side, we've got one plus three. That means four gas particles over here. But for my products, it's only got two. That means if the system would like to have a higher pressure, it will favor, in our case, the reverse reaction. Okay, so it's that easy. You must just go and make sure that you go and count the number of gas particles. Okay, now let's go over to the last one, and that's going to be our temperature. Now, it states here that an increase in temperature will favor the endothermic reaction, and a decrease in temperature will favor the exothermic reaction. Now, let's see why is that the case. Remember that for your exothermic reactions, your delta H, or your change in enthalpy, must be less than zero. And what it does is it releases heat to the surroundings. That means it increases the temperature of the surrounding. On the other hand, your endothermic is going to have a delta H greater than zero. It will absorb heat from the surrounding and thus it will actually end up decreasing the temperature. So that means if you go and increase the temperature, the system would obviously like to do the opposite. That means it would like to decrease the temperature. Now then it's got two options. It can either favor the endo or the exo to end up decreasing the temperature. So if it wants to decrease temperature, that means cool the surroundings down, it will favor the endothermic. And then you just need to go and determine by taking a look at your reaction, is the endothermic the forward or the reverse reaction? So let's maybe take a look at an example to explain this further. So we end up here with the temperature that has been decreased. We want to know which reaction will be favored. So the first thing that we actually need to take a look at is your delta H value. That will determine for us whether the forward reaction is exo or endothermic. So let's take a look at our specific delta H value. It tells us over here, as I read my reaction from left going towards the right hand side, delta H is greater than zero. That means it's an endothermic reaction. And therefore, that also indicates to me immediately that the reverse reaction will actually be exothermic. Now, please take note that they tell us here that we've decreased the temperature. So if we decrease the temperature, the system would obviously like to do the opposite. It would like to increase the temperature. And it can only increase the temperature by either favoring the endo or the exo. So increase in temperature is the exothermic that will be favored. And if I take a look at my reaction again, we'll notice exothermic is for me the reverse reaction. So that's how come we end up favoring in our case, the reverse reaction. 
Okay, so you can see it is quite easy. You just need to make sure that you know for specifically for temperature, you like take a look at your delta H values. For your pressure, you go and count specifically the gas particles. Please note, pressure doesn't go for solids or for liquids. It must be your gas particles that you count. And if we take a look at concentration, it's all got to do of whether you're going to be having the forward or the reverse reaction favored to increase or decrease that concentration. How do I recognize on the graph the factor that was changed? Great, thanks for that question. Um, we are going to be taking a look at all those three factors. Remember, it was concentration and pressure and temperature and how they will actually take a look at a different graph every time. Okay, now I'm going to give you one big graph to take a look at and I'm going to be changing all three of those factors on one graph so that you can see the difference every single time. Okay, so let's take a look at my graph that I've got going here for you. You'll notice here's my reaction at the top. We're going to start off with your COCl2 and this reactant is going to be broken up into chlorine gas and or carbon monoxide. Okay, and notice though that your forward reaction is in this case a delta H bigger than zero, that means endothermic. Now if I take a look at the first three lines here of my graphs, obviously each one of them representing my reactants in my reaction, you'll notice between naught and four that these lines are parallel to each other and thus parallel also to your x-axis. Now do not confuse that with rate of the reaction. Remember we said that the rate of the reaction when we get those parallel lines, it means at the end of the reaction. That's not true for chemical equilibrium. If you've got parallel lines that is parallel to the x-axis, it means the system is in equilibrium. And that means the rate of the forward reaction at that point is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Now we'll notice here that at the fourth minute, I've changed something. And after this change, we're gonna have an increase in the chlorine and the carbon monoxide and a decrease in our reactant. Okay, so I'm just going to write in here, we end up with an increase here, but a decrease in our reactant. Now, when there is a steady in or decrease like you see in this first point at four minutes, then the temperature was the thing that was changed. Now, what you would now need to go and figure out is whether we've increased or decreased the temperature to end up with the change that occurred. So let's take a look at the reaction again. I've shown you here that there's an increase in the products and a decrease in the reactants. That means that my forward reaction must have been favored. And our forward reaction, we said, is endothermic. So if we favor the endothermic reaction, that means the system wanted to decrease the temperature. And that means that you most probably increased the temperature. So because you increase the temperature, the system would like to decrease it, favoring the endothermic, which is in this case our forward reaction. And that's how come after that change in the fourth minute, you'll notice the chlorine and carbon monoxide, which is the products, increases, but that your reactance actually decreases. Okay, if you continue with our graph further on, we'll notice though between the eighth and the tenth minute, we once again reached equilibrium because these lines are parallel to each other and to the x-axis here at the bottom. Now, at the 10th minute, you'll notice though that the carbon monoxide has a spike. Now, this is a spike downwards. If you take a look at your y-axis, it talks about the concentration. That means we started here with a specific concentration of carbon monoxide and we rapidly decreased this concentration. So now we're going to take a look at if there's one spike in one of these three, it means the factor of concentration was changed. Good. Now you can see in this case, it was a decrease in concentration. Let's quickly see what would have been the effect according to Le Chatelier if we decreased this one concentration. So if I decrease it, decrease it, the system obviously would like to do the opposite. That means he would have liked to increase it and therefore he would have needed to favor the forward reaction. This forward reaction would have led to an increase in both my products and a decrease in my reactant. Okay, and the last factor that we're going to be taking a look at is then obviously pressure. And if you take a look at your graph here at the 14th minute, you'll notice that all of your reactants and products have shown a spike. So if all of them show a spike, then it means that you have actually changed the pressure. So first off again, if they gradually increase or decrease, temperature. If one of them shows a spike, concentration. If all of them spike, it's pressure that has been changed. <laughs>